The Brave Little Toaster is a weird movie. It's a story about lonely household appliances that go on a perilous journey to reunite with their master, who is a boy named Rob that used to visit the cabin during the summers but hasn't showed up in a while. And if you're an 80s kid like me, you may have vague memories of watching The Brave Little Toaster when you were younger, but not really remembering anything about it. So I decided to watch the movie again to refresh my memory of this cult 80s classic that the front cover boasts is an adorable adventure that kids will treasure. But I soon discovered that The Brave Little Toaster has some really weird moments that aren't adorable at all, and there's a lot of stuff in it that doesn't make any sense. The movie starts out feeling adorable, as we're introduced to each of the five main characters, and they all begin cleaning the cabin while jamming to Little Richard's Tutti Frutti. The fun screeches to a halt though, when Blanky hears a car that he thinks might be Little Rob coming back for a visit. But this is what I don't understand. Why would Blanky have better hearing than the other characters, like radio for example, that can pick up radio waves in the air? They build a tower to help Blanky get up to the attic window to see who's coming and Blanket has a daydream that the master has returned, only to be snapped back to reality when he realizes it was just another car passing by on the road. They all get sad, and then we're introduced to the grouchy air conditioner who tells them to get over it, because the master isn't coming back, and then he bursts into a Jack Nicholson tirade over being stuck in the wall and not being played with because the master couldn't reach his buttons, and then he blows himself up. This part was so weird and really was just unnecessary dramatic tension, and this won't be the last time this happens either. Right after this, another car pulls up and a man outside puts a for sale sign on the lawn, which motivates our heroes to go out on their own and find their master, rather than stay there and become someone else's property. So they hook up a car battery to an office chair and venture off into the outdoors towards the city to find Rob. After their first day of traveling, they rest for the night, but what doesn't make sense about this scene is the rules about how the characters sleep. Why do Lampy and Kirby sleep lying down, but not Toaster and Radio? At the beginning of the movie, we see the characters resting in their upright positions, so it doesn't make sense why all of a sudden some of them need to sleep lying down. In the morning, they come across a pond and some friendly animals that break out into an Esther Williams-style musical number, but then some squirrels start harassing Toaster by making faces in his reflective surface. So he runs and hides to escape them, and he finds a single flower who is so lonely, it thinks its reflection on Toaster is another flower and starts to hug him. Toaster gets scared and runs away, but he looks back and see the flower died because of its depression over being isolated. It's a fitting metaphor for the abandonment issues our main characters are going through. But what is odd about this whole scene is the lack of clarity in its tone. We start off on a happy note with a synchronized swimming musical number, but then it gets dark with the harassing squirrels and the dying flower metaphor. Then we cut back to the happy musical number, but then the animals start harassing Blanky, so they decide to leave. And as they leave, all the animals are smiling and waving like they had such a good time playing together. It's a really weird scene, but not as weird as the next scene. Because when they stop to rest for the second night, Toaster has a dream that quickly turns into a nightmare, when an evil looking clown kidnaps Rob and tries to short circuit Toaster with water and forks. The fear of water or forks are logical things for a Toaster to be afraid of, but why would a Toaster have a nightmare about a clown? When Toaster jolts himself awake, he and the others find out they're in the middle of a storm that swoops up and carries Blinky away. When they try to look for him, they realize the battery is dead, so Lampy sacrifices himself by becoming a lightning rod in order to charge it, and we're led to believe that he died. But within seconds we find out Lampy's sacrifice was actually another pointless moment of tension like the air conditioner, because it's quickly revealed that Lampy is still alive. They find Blanky stuck in a tree, but he's not really stuck because he's gripping onto the tree branch, so it appears he's more afraid of falling. But why would he be afraid of falling? Because he can float without getting hurt. We see him do this in the beginning of the movie, so why can't he do that here? Even still, Kirby flings his cord over the branch and then begins sucking it up to raise himself up to rescue Blanky. But what doesn't make sense about this is that in the very next scene when they come to a waterfall, Kirby has a nervous breakdown and starts to swallow his own cord which causes him to short circuit. But we just saw him swallow his own cord to rescue Blanky, so this is another moment of unnecessary dramatic tension. After Toaster revives Kirby, he gets angry at everyone saying he doesn't need them and they're a bunch of dead weight. But here we have another pointless moment of tension because after berating everyone, he goes right back to figuring out how they could cross the waterfall. So Kirby's emotional progression in this scene is really disjointed. 
After washing up into a swamp, the appliances are found by Elmo St. Peters, who is an appliance salesman, and their rescue quickly turns into a horror scene as they witness him cut out a blender motor to sell to a customer and are left speechless as they watch the blender's insides drip out like blood onto the floor. Isn't that adorable? After a pretty frightening song about how there's no escape from the store, they were actually able to escape Elmo's clutches by scaring him with his own reflection. That part sounds pretty ridiculous, but in the filmmaker's defense, it's actually a part lifted directly from the book. The characters find their way to the city, but our heroes are too late to catch Rob at his apartment, because he and his girlfriend Chris ironically left to go find them at the cabin to take them to college. While waiting for his return, the main characters find out that Rob is all grown up, and that his house has a bunch of fancy new appliances that make them feel obsolete and unwanted. So the new appliances throw out the old ones in the trash, and are taken to a junkyard where they have to hide from the evil scrap magnet that wants to put them in the crusher. In a twist of fate, Rob and Chris end up at the junkyard, and Rob finds all of his old stuff there except Toaster, who managed to escape the crusher. But then the magnet picks everyone else up and drops them onto the conveyor belt. And this is when the little Toaster finally earns his title of Brave, when he hurls himself into the Crusher's gears to stop Rob from getting hurt. And then we watch Toaster's body get completely mangled by the cogs until the Crusher stops. But since there are no real consequences to anybody's choices in this movie, Rob is able to repair our brave but hideously disfigured little Toaster to make him look and function just like new again. And then they all ride off to college to live happily ever after. So how did this weird and scary movie about a bunch of old appliances and their abandonment issues get labeled as adorable? I have no idea. And rewatching the brave little toaster after all these years did not spark as much joy as it may have when I was younger. So I think I'll be just fine leaving it alone for another 30 years. But let me know what you think of the movie in the comments below. And make sure to click on another video to enjoy more great content right here on Fun Fact Films.